So, um, so you know, what is hackable? Hackable is uh, the ability to debug your design, the ability to modify your design to make it do something you didn't originally intend. Um, it's also um, allowing other people to use your design in either the way you intended or maybe some way you didn't intend. So the things you can do to your design um, to facilitate all those things. So use the designer, your primary concern I think is getting your board working. And um, after you've done a few boards you'll realize your first version is probably not going to be fully functional. So my recommendation is don't go for the little tiny fits in the wearable board on your first try. Go ahead and make it a little bit bigger, put some um, hooks in there for debugging, which I'll go over. Um, and you know, save yourself some time instead of trying to tack blue wires on surface mount parts. You know, uh, we're going to avoid all that and just uh, make it more efficient. And the other thing is people that are not the designers. So if people, you've let your board go into the ether and it's open source, make it easy for them. And that includes everything you did for yourself, but there's some stuff at the end uh, on how you make that easier for um, the people down, down the road from you. And realizing that these people, are, are they're not the designers. They may be, have more skill than you. They may have a lot less. They may be kids in a junior high or something. And um, everything you can do to make it easier for you know, people that have less skill than you is, go is gonna make your board um, more acceptable. So the major thought is you're gonna plan ahead. You're not gonna just think about how's this thing gonna work, but how am I gonna get it to work? Um, and, uh, and avoid things like the mess on the right where you've got uh, dead bug chips uh, blue wired over to where they should have been, but you got the pin off pin out wrong because you looked at the wrong data sheet or some crazy thing like that. So these are the things you want to avoid. The one on the left is a little more typical, but um, I know my designs, 95% uh, of them have some sort of blue wire on red one. Uh, because that's wire wrap wire, it's really cheap, it's single core, so it's easy to solder to. Uh, the right back the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can get black but then that's for ground. You can get red, but that's for you know power. So blue is the other color. <laughs> so the first recommendation is keep your options open. So on the top, you can see there's this uh, IMU, and somebody, me, um, wired um, the optional address line to VCC. So that's hard set. It's got two kinds. It's got two sets of I squared C addresses you can use. This one is stuck, and you'll notice. Um, the uh, pin four is, you know, you might get in there and cut that line on the outside, but shoot, it, uh, I did a, a power plane on the top layer and it goes right through the middle of the part. You're never going to get that loose. You're going to have to, you know, pull the pin up, which is really hard. Uh, it would be a messy rework. So instead, run the lines out to either you know, like pull-ups, which are um, you know, you could take the, the resistor off and do an easy rework, or there are these um, pull up or pull down solder bridge things that are in one of SparkFun's libraries, which I use. Um, so it's pretty easy to, to swipe the solder off and swipe the solder on the other on the other bridge. You don't have to use any blue wires at all. So keeping your options open, here are your options. You can use two or three pin headers, so you make it super easy. I just you know, go back and forth. And that's really good for somebody downstream. They maybe have another I squared C device or, or SPI or whatever it is, and they need to get it to a different address. Now you've made it really easy for the next person. Or for yourself, if you've suddenly discovered that you've got two I squared C devices com competing with each other. Um, and the resistor pull ups and pull downs. Okay. Visibility. So I think um, all too often, I have not put enough test points on my board. Happens all the time. So in you know priority bus pins, definitely got to have test points on those because when you're debugging your software, you're going to need that, let alone you debugging your hardware. Um, if you've got signals that go straight between two um, service mount ICs with no vias, that's a, a problem getting to. So put a test point on those. Um, if you've got SMT connectors, 
Again, that's, it's a connector, but it's not usable like a normal connector is for debugging purposes. So put some uh, test points there. And of course, VC and ground, because you got to ground your scope or your uh, logic analyzer. So here's an example. This board is packed. It's a smoothie board. It's a five axis motor controller. And you see this thing, there's no room, Greg. You can't put test points on here. Well, surprise. This guy's got test points all over his board. Every, every uh, motor controller's got its own set. You know, you can put a little four pin header here and get right to the, the motor signals. He's even taken the signals he didn't use, uh, you know, P2.7, put it on a, on a point he can get to. So maybe you can wiggle that pin during debug and say, oh, if this pin wiggles, I got to a, a subroutine or something. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing that people uh, often don't think about is going vertical. Um, so for example, I'm designing a badge and I'm going to have a display on it. But there's all kinds of displays I could put on here. And just the 128 by 64 uh, pixel, there's three different ones on DigiKey that showed up that are cheap. They've got about the same uh, signals on them, but they've got completely different mechanical packages. So. What you can do, or what I do, is, and I've seen this done many times, you just put, you know, 0.1 inch headers on your board, and you make a daughter board, um, and put your display on that, especially for Rev1. Then if you get to work on this and you don't like the display, put a different board on here. You don't have to turn your whole board, just have to do a little tiny board, switch displays. And you can do this for, um, like, uh, service mount connectors you're not sure about. Um, IMUs, maybe this IMU is right, maybe it's not, maybe it's got some issue. And just about anything you can put up here on a header that you've got any, any inkling that you may not want to use one you've picked. Um, yeah. The next one is the, the silk screen. So write legibly. So this is an example of one of my boards. I've made every mistake possible on silkscreen in this little area. So you can see the zeros there, uh, overlapping silkscreen. I got silkscreen that's too small. The capacitor um, identifiers are, are uh, 0.016 high. I've got uh, silkscreen over an SMT pad, over a BIA. Um, and there's one more. Oh, the, the pin one identifier, once I soldered that part down, you can't tell where pin one is. So. I think I made all the mistakes in that little tiny spot on my board. Um, and so here's, here's the list. Uh, the other things you might want to add to your board are, of course, a descriptive board name, a little version letter, because it's very nice to be able to look at the board instantly and not have to look at the, go through some rigmarole trying to figure out, is this a version A or B or C? Um, put a white block for notes. The notes would be like T for tested, um, R for reworked one for rework number one, two, three, four. So white block in, in silk screen comes in really handy. Maybe even a P for program, so you, you've got the, the part program, don't have to wonder. A little black sharpie, just a little tiny, you know, doesn't have to be a big block, just big enough for you to write, you know, initials. Um, Are there any questions for the uh, ICA? Ah. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is post, this is later on in the system when you're, you know, got it all assembled and everything. That's when you start writing the notes. Uh, polarity indicators are, are critical for, um, you know, LEDs, diodes, ICs, finding out where pin one is really quickly. You don't have to go back to your schematic and then look at the layout and try to figure out where is, is pin one in the upper left or the lower, upper left or lower right? I don't know. Um, some signal names, especially on connectors or on test points. And when you have jumpers, you gotta, you know, you gotta say something about what those jumpers are for, especially for, you know, the, the guy downstream. You may know natively, you know, what the jumpers do, but they won't. So definitely uh, label your jumpers. So, so what I do, um, usually, I didn't do it on this board, obviously, is I go into a Gerber viewer, or you can use um, OSH Parks viewer, and you can just look and you say, oh, do I see over, kind of turn your mind into this graphic calculator, do I see silkscreen over 
um, over uh, um, vias? Do I see silk stream over SMT pads? And you just turn on those two layers and just look at them and just maybe flick the, uh, the pads on and off and see if something disappears. That's great. I didn't know you could do next door. I'm using GERB view, but I'm just flicking these on and off. That's great. Yeah. Oh, the other thing I didn't mention is, in case you guys don't know, that 15% means that's the width of the silk screen. So if you have a 0.032 high, which is the minimum, don't go below that, don't go 0.024, 15% means 15% of that number is the width of the silk screen. And you should know that about the best typical resolution is five mils for silk screen. They don't have a lot of uh, resolution there. And sometimes it's even seven. OSH Park gets down to about three before it becomes il illegible. So. So 0.032 at 15 would be a five mil wide text uh, lines. Oh yeah, I've, I've had that problem. Yeah. Perfectly legible silk screen in, in prototype was illegible in production and um, had to turn the board for the silk screen. That's painful. Okay, and let's talk about the guys downstream from you. Um, Share responsibly. So putting OSH symbol on your board is not making it open source as far as I'm concerned. That's just, you know, irresponsible. Uh, simply you'll see that board and say, oh, I, I need this board. This is perfect for me. Well, what do I do? Well, Drew fortunately put a link to his GitHub repository right on the board. That's great, right? And GitHub is, I think, the, the way everyone's sharing their uh, open source uh, stuff now. Um, you can share it on your own personal site. My site disappeared. None of my stuff is available anymore because I haven't bothered to put it on GitHub. So uh, <laughs> don't let that happen to you. Um, GitHub won't disappear. And when you're sharing, Adafruit sets a really high bar for sharing. And I'm not going to, unlike uh, a talk yesterday, I don't think you have to do Adafruit level uh, documentation. And you know, it's great if you do, but I'm going to try to give you maybe what I feel is the more of the minimum level um, to make your things really uh, usable. So your schematic is where you can start. Everybody's going to look at the schematic. They're probably going to look at the schematic before they order or buy or use the board. So you want it self-documenting. And that doesn't mean just a few labels on some signals. You want to have um, you know, what voltage comes on in the input. Is it 9 volts? Is it 5? Is it 3.3? You know, what do the different blocks do? Um, just anything you can put on there that helps you or somebody else that's unfamiliar, unfamiliar with your board figure out what's going on where. Um, but I recommend you go uh, watch Andrew Greenberg's Make You Open Source Schematics Not Suck lecture if you didn't already see it. That was yesterday. It was great. Um, he talked about, you know, uh, how to make them more readable and um, kind of like schematic um, design patterns, right? Signals go from left to right. Uh, power should be high. Ground should be down below and so forth. So, um, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, and the bomb, uh, there have been a couple of people talking about the bomb. I know um, now I'm just talking about bomb over there. And those were more, if you're going to go into production eventually, so they went into a lot of detail. I, uh, Andrew did it in a different talk about how much you should put in your bomb. So this is the bomb that comes out of Eagle natively. This is not good yet. Um, so to me, there's about, there's about three things you need to add to this. So for one thing, there's stuff missing. So you need pin headers, because this happens to be a, um, an Arduino shield. So you need the pin headers. Got to order those. Got to add those. Um, uh, there might be something else on here that need to be added. But anyway, so you definitely need to add the things that don't show up. Um, the other thing is you've got to put some more columns. 
and talk about you know, who the manufacturer is, Maxim, whatever, what the manufacturer's part number is, and if you're kind, you can say, well, I bought these from Digikey, and this is the part number. If you order this part number, it will work as good as it did for me. Otherwise, somebody can, you know, how these part numbers get <laughs> really long, and it means, oh, it's a different kind of SMT package. It's not going to solder down. It may look on the website that it's right. It's still a quad flat pack, no pins, but it's a different, actually a different size. You get it in, you'll go, ah, it doesn't fit on the board. So give them as much information you can on the right parts. The other thing is I tend to edit um, the value. So the value in the, in the schematic is not, maybe not enough information. So for example, on a capacitor, you may have to give the voltage and things like that. Uh, okay. Almost done. Okay, so as I said, GitHub, I, I think that's the right place to share things. The, the site's not going to go down. It takes care of revision control. It's a popular place to go. You can point to it from your, the back of your board like Drew did. Um, and what should you put up there? In, in my opinion, yeah, you should put your, your CAD files up there, the schematic and the board, but you should put a PDF of your schematic up there. Again, this may be a high school kid, and he doesn't have KiCad. So, well, he may not. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, give him a PDF. If one thing, they can see your board and, and download the PDF and look at it right away and say, yeah, this looks like something I can use or I can't. And, and <laughs> even that. I don't have I don't have uh, you know cadence I don't I don't have KiCad actually I use Eagle so if you only have the KiCad schematic up there I can't kind of can't use your board um, and the Gerber's so the board file and the Gerber's again um, maybe I don't have KiCad but if you have the Gerber's there I can send that out and get some boards made um, as I said the bomb with manufacturers part numbers at least and maybe some firmware a library some example code maybe you don't want to give all your code away but if you do you know put it up there. Don't forget to put it in there. Read me. Um, uh, Drew's example, he did almost a uh, add a fruit tutorial on using his board, which is great uh, if you have the time to do that. But I'm saying these are things that you can pretty much generate really fast. And very, very quickly, you can type out a read me that says what the board is, what it does, what the current rev is, your contact information, a link to the article about it on Hackaday, things like that even if you don't do a big tutorial in GitHub, right? Just do those like four or five basic things. And that's it. Talked about exactly this. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I didn't. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it. But uh, but yeah, I'm gonna watch it too. Um, anyway, thank you, Greg.